Coming up on Primetime Politics Weekend, the special rapporteur pushes back. Rapporteur David Johnson said he isn't going anywhere. In fact, he said he doesn't work for Parliament or Canadians. He said he works for the government. That's the problem, Mr. Speaker. David Johnston says he will stay on the job despite a House motion that calls on the former GG to step aside. What impact can his investigation have if a majority of MPs don't have confidence in his mandate? We'll speak with our journalist panel. Also, children are waiting months, uh, if not years, for the care and help that they, they need. A damning report on the state of child welfare in Nunavut. A lack of response to suspected harm. No check-ins on the well-being of children put into care. We will speak with Canada's Auditor General who says the territorial government is failing to protect vulnerable children. And creating a National Space Council. Why is it needed? What impact would it have on high-tech industries and jobs in this country? We'll speak to the CEO of Space Canada. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. David Johnston was not on Parliament Hill this week, but his name was raised more than once as opposition MPs reacted to the former Governor General's response to an NDP motion passed by parliamentarians on Wednesday. It calls on the special rapporteur to step aside, but Johnston says he will not, prompting this reaction from NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. What I've been focused on is the appearance of bias. And given that strong appearance of bias, I disagree with Mr. Johnson. I think he is, he's made the wrong decision. Given that appearance of bias, he can no longer do the work that it was intended to be done. The work was to restore confidence that everything is being done in elect- in our, by our government and in the electoral system to ensure that we're free from foreign interference. That work requires the trust and the confidence of the public, and that has been eroded by this appearance of bias, which is too strong. So I disagree with Mr. Johnson in his decision to remain as a special rapporteur. I'll continue to put pressure on the government to launch what should have always been their appropriate response, which is a public inquiry that has the rigor of cross-examination, witnesses that are sworn in, and an independent judge to assess what information should be disclosed or, or, or kept private. That is the approach that we maintain is the right approach. Well, for many people on Parliament Hill, Tuesday's agenda is already set. David Johnston, the former Governor General and current Special Rapporteur, will appear before the House Procedures Committee. The purpose? To answer questions about his first report on foreign interference and his recommendation against a public inquiry. Not to mention his pushback against a parliamentary motion that called on Johnston to step aside. Well, to talk about this, we're now joined by our Friday journalist, Susan Delacourt, is a columnist for the Toronto Star, Stephanie Taylor, parliamentary reporter for the Canadian Press, and Catherine Levesque, parliamentary reporter for the National Post. Good to see the three of you. Hi, nice to be here. So listen, we'll, we'll get into Tuesday in a moment, but, I, but first I want to begin here with David Johnston's decision to stay put. As we know, the majority of MPs voted for him to step aside. He says he's not going to do that. So what does this do for the whole process, his report on foreign interference? Will that be trusted or is this whole process now tainted? Uh, Susan, I'll get you to start us out. I'm, you know, I say this regretfully because I'm, I really like Mr. Johnson, but I, I think this thing has become a circus, you know, and even as far back as a week ago, I didn't think that he could be in charge of the public hearings. You know, I, I, I'd suggest they'd, they do something different with them, have a different expert in charge of each one or something, but um, he's really dug himself in now, and I, I don't know how they get out of that. I think all we've seen from the government so far is buying time, and um, maybe they think they can just weather it until Parliament rises, but I, I think it's, I, I, I regretfully say that I think that uh, it won't work. Yeah, what do you think, Stephanie? Because he still has work to do. He's been mandated to do something, not something, something that is fairly important, but, you know, to to, to address foreign interference in the electoral process. Is it tainted now? I think an already troubled process got even more troubled this week uh, when Mr. Johnston actually responded and said, you know, essentially, thank you for expressing your opinion, Parliament, but I'm not going to listen. I get my mandate from the government. So now he's kind of entangled himself into this and we have to remember that this was like troubled from a troubled process from the start i mean it it, if we rewind the clock it took trudeau 
several weeks before even announcing that there was going to be this process of a special rapporteur. And he got hammered for several weeks in question period and by opposition leaders calling for a public inquiry. So when this process was even announced, the Liberals did it looking like it was a defensive movie, looking like they were on the back foot. And really, since that has been announced in March, they've had to explain and explain and explain why this is a legitimate process, why people should trust this process, why the opposition members are wrong, and they still can't make this go away. And we're not even necessarily even talking about the substance of the report, which is something the Prime Minister charges all the time. But at the end of the day, it was him who made this appointment. And it is on the Liberals who have set this process up, which doesn't seem to be answering or satisfying any of the questions it was designed to. Yeah, yeah, and it really is one of these cases where it seems like the horse is out of the barn. So, so what happens with, with his report, Catherine? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, I mean, he, he will have he, these public hearings, uh, you know, possibly during the summer, during the fall. But, uh, you know, his next report is due before the end of October. So that's coming up quite fast. You know, the question I have is, are, are people going to want to testify or, you know, to talk to him and, and to be in these public hearings? I mean, you know, certainly we, we had a, a poll this week in the National Post from Leger uh, showing that, in fact, you know, barely more than a quarter of Canadians actually believe that David Johnston is, is suited in this role. And we've heard from, uh, you know, groups uh, from Tibetans or Uyghurs, uh, you know, kind of criticizing David Johnston for still being in that role, but also the government for not uh, holding a public inquiry as they asked him to. So, you know, this is not just a partisan issue here. I think, you know, it's it's really a question of, of confidence, of, you know, uh, do, do we of trust? Can we trust David Johnston? You know, I think he've, he's shown in his report that, you know, he's actually done some good work, some decent work. But I think the question is now, you know, is he able to push against the government's narrative and to, you know, push back against, you know, what uh, CSIS or the Prime Minister's office would say and, you know, actually get to the bottom of what happened instead of just taking the intelligence, assessing it, and then presenting his report. Well, it's interesting to use the word trust because, as we know, the, the government has, has been criticizing the opposition, saying that they're essentially destroying David Johnston's reputation uh, for, for political gain, although, you know, arguably, or is the government destroying David Johnson's reputation by using him a as a shield? Uh, Susan, what do you say to that? You know, I, I think it's worth rolling back the tape to when the Prime Minister set this up, and he, he said something remarkable then, which was, frankly, nobody's going to believe a word I say. You know, I, there, there's a certain constituency, so that's why David Johnson had to be in there. So there was this idea then that, that David Johnson was the not Trudeau. He was somebody independent of Trudeau, and as Stephanie said, he kind of dug himself in with his statement this week is, I, 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 it's the government's mandate I'm following. And it was, that wasn't the way this was supposed to go. So um, I, I really think that was his statement. I think his op-ed in the Globe and his statement this week in reply to the parliamentary vote were both a little off. They, they weren't, um, yeah, they were discordant with the, the mood of the times too. And I, I, I had expected, which shows you how dumb I can be after all these many years, I thought he was going to step down uh, after the vote, but he's, uh, he's dug in. Yeah, dug in as you say, but you know, it, is his reputation being harmed more by the opposition or by the government here? Does it distract from the bigger issue of foreign interference? Stephanie, Stephanie Catherine. Um, look, I mean, I, I think, you know, either or could have made this decision this week, right? I mean, you know, David Johnston was asked to produce this first report, you know, he kind of offered to conduct these public hearings. Um, you know, the government could have also decided to just, you know, have, hold a public inquiry and, you know, name a commissioner, you know, who would, this magical unicorn, which would, you know, satisfy everyone, right? I, I don't know who this person is, but, um, and, and David Johnston, you know, also had the possibility to step down and, and to say, you know what, I'm. I'm going to have a peaceful summer and I'm <laughs> not going to, you know, deal with all this. Um, so, but it, we're, really what we, we're seeing from Mr. Johnston is, you know, like Susan said, I mean, he's said, uh, you know, two times already that he will stay, that he's committed to going through this process. And I, you know, I really think it speaks to his sense of duty and commitment. And I think that's, um, you know, that, that's, that's great. I, I really commend him for that. But at the same time, I mean, look, you know, at the end of this process, but what is his reputation going to be? You know, I, I kind of worry about that and, you know, because everything is going to be picked apart and um, especially also in committee next week. Yeah, yeah. Stephanie, what, what would you say about his reputation and how it's being used by, by members of parliament on both sides? 
there was something in his statement that stuck out to me where he acknowledged that he he knew this wasn't going to be without controversy or it was wording to that and i wonder if he expected it to get to this level and i i and this whole debacle or this whole process however you want to characterize it really makes me wonder if folks were a little bit naive as to did people think did the Prime Minister, did people in his office think, did Liberal MPs on the front bench think that putting this process in place was going to take the temperature down? Because when the process was even announced that David Johnston was going to be this uh, special rapporteur, he was going to do this, this report, that he was a Governor General appointed by conservative, former Conservative Prime Minister Stephen Harper, if people actually thought that that was going to work, especially in, in this minority parliament, especially when you have opposition parties unanimously calling for a public inquiry. And so I, I wonder for Mr. Johnston's part, and we're going to talk about his committee appearance next week, if he fully expected it to get to the level it has. And I know when he was speaking to reporters last week, he mentioned that this was the first time in his very long career that his impartiality had been questioned and he found it very troubling. So I, I think some of this story is also taking, looking at where are we at as a country in the political climate and the political climate of the commons at a time when you have the prime minister saying uh, essentially let's take the temperature down and, and stick to the substance of this report which is no, and he's, he's kind of the only one in the room even saying this at this point. Yeah, yeah, only one as you say. But l let's look ahead to Tuesday. As we know, uh, David Johnson will be appearing. Uh, it's uh, scheduled for I, I think 10 a.m. Eastern when he'll, he'll start what's expected to be a three-hour testimony. What will you be watching for, Catherine? Oh goodness, I I think he'll be asked about the Trudeau Foundation a lot. I, I know he's been criticized by the uh, the conservatives for not having touched that part. Although I think you know, with with all the committee hearings in the past few weeks, I think we've kind of you know went through all, all the all the facts and everything that that happened there. But uh, you know, certainly I think he, he'll be asked about that. I think there will be a lot of questions as to why he's not stepping down. <laughs> you know, why he's not re responding to the NDP motion that was passed this week. So I expect a, a lot of questions. I, I don't know if we'll have you know as as many answers as as we want. But uh, look, I, I think it's going to be a, a hard three um, three hours for him. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, what would you say? David Johnston is going to want to talk about his report and MPs are going to want to talk about David Johnston. So he's going to have to find a way to navigate himself in that situation. One thing I am watching for is whether Mr. Johnston does get any question or does have the ability to talk about what this hearing process is supposed to look like. Because as, as he says, he's decided to stay, he feels that it's a public service to stay. What is this hearing process gonna look like? And I know one of the questions I have is how is this hearing process gonna look any different than the committee appearances we've had up and up to this date? We've had two committees, we've had a number of government officials, both past and present, a number of members of diaspora communities who have frankly been testifying for years of threats and intimidation attempts at foreign interference. So I, I don't know if we're going to get there in the committee appearance, if we're talking about the Trudeau Foundation and the ties to the Trudeau family, but I think it would be very interesting to know from Mr. Johnston how we, he imagines the public hearing process of this working, which essentially he's saying, wait, my work isn't done yet. Yeah, and that's always the, the challenge with committees, right? Uh, how much of it is politics you're going to hear or, or substantive information that you're going to want to answer questions? Susan, what's your expectations? What are you watching out for? Uh, for the independence factor. I, I would like to know whether those hearings or whether how much this process was. that The Liberals, again, have not helped on this sco score. They're, they've actually lifted words from his report, like bailed in ignorance and thrown it back. And it looks like the government and, and the, the Johnson process working hand in glove you know so I, th I think if if I were Mr. Johnson I'd study up this weekend on presenting himself as his own man and as independent from the government as he can. Okay well we'll be watching and no doubt we'll reconvene <laughs> next week but for now Susan, Stephanie, Catherine thank you for the time today. About two weeks ago, Jocelyn Terrien tabled her report on military attitudes towards sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. You may remember Terrien is the external monitor appointed by the government to make sure sexual misconduct is being addressed by the forces. In particular, that the 48 recommendations made by former Supreme Court Justice Louise Arbour are being implemented within the force. Well, with some reaction to this first biannual status report, we're now joined by Charlotte Duval-Antoine. She is a fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, also the author of The Ones We Let Down, Toxic Leadership Culture and Gender Integration in the Canadian Armed Forces. Charlotte, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. 
Thanks for having me again, Michael. Now, Madame Terrien, she, she did table this report a couple of weeks ago, and having had time to look at it, I, I'm wondering what stands out for you as a high point in addressing sexual misconduct and misogyny in the armed forces? What I was very pleasantly surprised in what the external monitor reported in her in her latest report was the fact that the military is doing a lot right now, especially structurally, to help with the changes that Madame Arbor had recommended last year. Uh, we're seeing a lot of movement, especially at the recruiting school, with instructors being vetted properly and uh, staffed completely. And also the fact that the military is putting in place professional conduct and culture officers within each command. That is very encouraging. And we see that things are moving forward, which we hadn't heard about much before that report came out. Mm -hmm. so, so, so some highlights, as you say, but let's talk about low points then, because obviously the work is not yet done. Absolutely. I mean, it's we know the military tends to move slowly and, and the work is enormous on their end. Um, one of the things uh, that that stands out to me is the fact that she's worried about the lack of a strategic plan and the fact that aside from what her office is doing, there is no formal processes for monitoring and overseeing if the changes have an intended effect. But also on top of that, I find the report quite vague. I mean, it's also to the fact that it's quite short. But the thing is that we, we see progress, but we don't really know what the details are therein. And because of that, we do not know how it will look on the ground just yet. There are those activities. We know what they are high level but we do not know how they operate within the institution just yet. And for that, I would be optimistic because we're seeing activities, but I would say I would put a little asterisk to this by saying that for now, we do not know how this would go when confronted with the Canadian Armed Forces culture today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so as you say, some, some answered, unanswered questions still, but you know, let's get back to this uh, strategic plan, this overall strategic plan, because as you say, Madame Therrien says none exists. Why is that? Why is that piece missing? I think it's because of the way that the military operates. We've seen that with Operation Honor in 2015. And when we were promised a strategic plan and then it came out in 2020. So, so we're seeing the military having difficulties committing to a strategic plan, especially when it comes to, to sexual misconduct. So this is an issue, and I know internally they're working on that, but the problem is that the process is a little bit too long. They're trying to get everything perfect instead of getting objectives down and understand that they need short, mid, and long-term objectives. So they're not there yet. They're working on that. But I would like to underline why it is important to have a, a plan is so that not only we know that the military is right on track and that the activities that we're seeing today are not just a flurry of activities as Madame Arbor described in her report last year, but it's also to make sure that we can measure progress effectively and make sure that we can fine tune policies and structures in place so that they can have the intended effect. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that when we start putting everything in place, we find ourselves in a difficulty to really understand whether each intervention has the intended effect or whether or not there has been a change of culture because of something else and whether or not the policies that have been in place and the structures that have been put in place are useful for the service members that want to help the military move forward on culture change. Yeah, moving forward on culture change, as you say. But, you know, right now, uh, you, you're well aware of this, the, the forces are struggling with the recruitment. Uh, in fact, in some cases, they're even asking people to delay retirement and or reconsider leaving the forces because they're, sh they're so short-staffed. How much of this do you think is tied to the kind of treatment women and racialized recruits receive in the forces? So the thing is that we do not have huge data on this but anecdotally i've met a couple of people that that have left the military over the sexual misconduct scandals and are preempted of not joining the military because they're scared of how they're going to be treated so anecdotally i've had those conversations with people we're looking into getting that data 
but honestly like if you don't if you feel like you're not going to be welcome in an institution you're less likely to join it some people do not prioritize this as much as other people but we cannot overlook that fact and and we see that also among uh air cadets the young folks that, that are involved in the military uh in a way that do not want to join the regular forces or the reserve forces for that reason then there's a lot of other factors obviously but you know like when you look at factors it's usually accumulation of things and we cannot deny the fact that that might have an impact because people care about how they're going to be treated within an organization mm -hmm. well that all said as we said this was the only the first report from the external monitor more will come what will you be looking for in terms of next steps so she's been very clear about what she's looking for for her next report and i'm I'm very interested in, in seeing that second report, actually, because it's very much focused on whether or not the policies are having the intended effect and moving a little bit the conversation outside of the national headquarters of defense to the people in the field, the people who are experiencing culture in bigger ways than, than the people who are making the policies. So I do think that right now the report is quite brings quite a cautious optimism in me but i might i think that the october report is going to be way more hard hitting and i'm going to be reading it very closely when it comes out in six months well without doubt we'll speak again at that point uh, but charlotte de val antoine for now thank you for the time good to see you again always a pleasure thank you so much As we told you earlier in the program, David Johnston says he will not step down as Special Rapporteur, even though a majority of MPs think he should. Johnston is defending his role, saying his mandate comes from government, not from Parliament, prompting this debate in the House of Commons earlier in the week. Mr. Speaker, in response to yesterday's vote, where MPs representing a clear majority of Canadians voted for him to step aside, Rapporteur David Johnson said he isn't going anywhere. In fact, he said he doesn't work for Parliament or Canadians. He said he works for the government. That's the problem, Mr. Speaker. He works for the same Liberal government that benefited from Beijing's election interference. And he personally serves the Prime Minister who chose to do nothing while Chinese Canadians were bullied into voting for his Liberal Party. Right. Nobody is fooled by this sham of a process. So when will the Prime Minister fire his ski buddy and call a public inquiry? Right. <laughs> Honourable Member for our Minister for Emergency Preparedness. I'm reminded once again that it's not only unfair but deeply offensive to, 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 to listen to the member opposite question Mr. Johnson's allegiance to this country. His 15-year career in public service has made it crystal clear to everyone that his loyalty is to Canada. And Mr. Speaker, as I also said, and as I quote former Prime Minister Harper, Mr. Johnson represents hard work, dedication, public service, and humility. Mr. Speaker, Canada is blessed to have a man so dedicated to public service, persevering through this type of abuse. With more, we're now joined by Susan Smith, Principal with the Blue Sky Strategy Group. Tim Powers is Chair of Summa Strategies. And Kim Wright is Principal with Wright Strategies. Hello to the three of you. Hello. Hi, Michael. Susan, I'll get you hey, to start Michael. us out. Hey, Tim. Uh, Susan, I'm going to get you to start us out here because David Johnson, as we know, is staying put. Uh, are you surprised by this? You know, given that the majority of MPs want him to step down, shouldn't he be listening to the will of Parliament? Well, he's not an officer of Parliament, Michael, and he was appointed by the government. So he's very right when he says that that is, in fact, the case. I think it's a challenging situation when Parliament has twice said they don't have confidence in him. Or, I, But I do think it's, that's become a partisan issue. It's not about his ability. It's not about his skill. It's not about the fact that he is supposed to um, be getting to the root of any potential foreign interference in a uh, Canadian election in our democracy, that the opposition seems to have moved away from that and they're just going straight at Mr. Johnson because they feel that that's a path to Mr. Trudeau. I think it's unfortunate. He's an upstanding Canadian, eminently qualified to do the work, but uh, it, it can be seen as a bit of a distraction from the outright 
um, objective of the exercise, which is to determine has there been foreign interference in an election. Okay, Tim, I'll get you to, to weigh in here because I, I think just for clarity, you know, to, to listen, for example, to Jagmeet Singh, he says this has nothing to do with Mr. Johnston. They they think he's an up, up upstanding person, but he, the NDP, believe that the appearance of, of bias is, is just too strong, too apparent. So if that's the case, Tim, will Johnston's uh, second report carry any real weight? when it comes to foreign interference, if this appearance or this apprehension of, of bias exists? Well, if that were the case, though, I mean, I, look, I, I think everybody's playing politics here. So start with the NDP's politics, Michael. If they were so serious about this and so concerned about it, why wouldn't they push to withdraw their confidence uh, in the agreement they have with the government? I mean, they're being a bit like paper tigers here, and I think that's a bit insulting. Um, you know, Mr. Johnson, I think, is digging in because he's got nothing to lose at this circum at this point in his life. Um, he he believes he's doing good work. I think all the parties here, unfortunately, are not helping the bigger issue, which is the matter of whether or not and how pervasive foreign interference is because everybody's focusing on Mr. Johnson and they're not focusing on the key elements in the report. Things like uh, Aaron O'Toole revealed earlier this week when he became aware that he was subject to a lot of uh, interference, to use that word, by, by, Chinese, by, by Chinese authorities. So, you know, Mr. Johnson is a convenient political tool for everybody, including the prime minister, because it prevents him from having to talk to the substantive issues here. So I think they're happy to use Mr. Johnson as, as a shield, and that's unfortunate for all of us because we've got to get at the meat Mr. Johnson brought up in his first report. Yeah, okay, and, and Kim, I'll have you jump in because, you know, that is th this interesting point, whether or not this is just all political theater because yeah, Johnston does say that his recommendations, uh, the one, this, especially the second one, will go to preventing foreign interference from happening again. Uh, and is that not what this is truly about, especially if Johnson says that there is no evidence to suggest the government failed to act on the information it had? Well, what they had and how they portrayed it is actually one of the challenges that we've been seeing, frankly. Uh, you know, we look at uh, Bill Blair, you know, couldn't access a portal, which seems a little implausible to me. But even then, he would have a briefing package, a paper copy, shocking that we still use paper copies of things, uh, and that he would be able to have had access to that. At, at the end of the day, there are so many things in here that pass credibility in general public. And when you go back to Mr. Johnston's press conference, which was, well, gosh, if you'd seen the evidence I saw, you'd believe this was all fine and dandy too. Sure except for you're not actually showing us what the evidence is. You're saying, trust me. Uh, and what we've had for months now, going back you know, into, into February, where the prime minister started with, these are all scurrilous allegations. There's absolutely no truth to it. To, well, there might be some truth. To, hey, we're gonna put millions of dollars into a new office of foreign interference uh, in the budget. Uh, and then we're going to have the special rapporteur. Like, there's so many elements of this. Had they actually months and months and months ago said, you know, maybe we should just have a open airing of this as much as we can with redacted documents and all the rest of it, uh, and and get to the heart of this to make sure that Canadians believe that our elections are run without foreign interference from China, from Russia, and any other agents that are, are okay, trying to I, knock can, on the doors. Can I push back, though, there on Kim? Because, you know, just, just take Mr. Johnson's side a bit here. He, he does say that, you know, if it were to be anything more than what he's suggesting, it would be uh, compromising to national intelligence, national security. Yes. And so, <laughs> so and, and, how well, does, that, does, does, does that not... Say. And we're also talking about a former governor general who's making these conclusions. Can we not give him the benefit okay, of the doubt on that can, level? No. And a legal no, scholar, fact, too. Hold, yeah. hold on one second, Susan. I was asked the question here. The reality is that there were lots of things that can go forward. Yes, some of it will be redacted. Are you suggesting that the Air India inquiry or the... 
inquiry or mayor or didn't have security implications like come on that is an easy say oh well it's security it's national security and maybe five eyes are going to be mad at us this is the this has been the talking point from the beginning but there are some things where we know that parliamentarians at least three potentially more have been targeted uh and so how do we know this how do we get to the bottom of this how do we keep our democracy safe those are the things that every parliamentarian is asking themselves and what we saw in that vote uh, this week is that even liberals have said, oh, wait a minute, we actually do need to get to the bottom of this. This is actually not passing the smell test in our communities. And they're going to have to go back on the barbecue circuit this summer and have to face some really harsh mm. criticisms. Who knew what, when, and how do we get to the bottom of okay. this? Okay, so Susan, you know, let's now flip to the other point then. Why not just call public inquiry? Because as you know, the Prime Minister is not beholden to the special rapporteur. He says he'll follow up. He's not really beholden by, by any law on this. And in the meantime, liberals are being painted as uh, as participating and benefiting from a cover-up. So I, I'm on the record at the beginning of all this, Michael, saying, you know, public inquiry might be a simpler thing to do, but it's very, very important to underline that these are issues of national security. So like the mayor or our inquiry that Kim is referring to, there were many, many parts of that that were in camera. So when you're talking about issues of national security, whether it's a special rapporteur or a public inquiry, it is not an airing of all the laundry and all things. And I want to take a step back. I mean, if this is about potential interference in our democracy, the um, whoever is doing it, whatever the foreign interference interfering are, and we you know we believe it's China, it's working right now in the sense of forget about elections. Look at this exact snapshot of moment in time because what they've got done is they've got the They've got the politicians, the opposition politicians, talking about the special rapporteur instead of about the issues. So I think what everybody needs to do is take a deep breath, let Mr. Johnston do his job. He's a former constitutional scholar. He's a former governor general. He's had national security clearance level for years. He's an eminent Canadian. He's going to hold public hearings. There will be things that are aired in public. But guess what, everybody? You don't get to see all the national security stuff. And that's what people have to understand about this. So I think things, the noise could have been avoided if we'd had a public inquiry right from the get go, but we're not there. But we do have an eminent Canadian who's highly qualified to do the job. We should stop squawking and let him get to get down to doing his job and put forward a report that's going to remind everybody that we have a strong and robust democracy. And mm -hmm. if there are some potential chinks in that armor as a result of foreign interference, that, we, that our institutions are doing the things that they need to be doing. Okay, listen, I, I, obviously we're going to keep following the story, but I've got three minutes left here. I need to ask each of one of you very quickly, a quick go around here. You know, Danielle Smith and the future of Alberta-Ottawa relations. She says she wants to reset that relationship following her, her, her majority win in Alberta. What should we expect? Uh, Tim, I'll begin with you. Well, there's only been one Conservative Premier uh, in the last 15 years, seven, it's actually 18 years, Michael, who served out a full term. That was Ralph Klein. Uh, and she, of course, invoked Ralph Klein the other day. The bigger challenge for Danielle Smith will be, can she hold her caucus together? And that will determine what she does in the federal-provincial relationship front. I think, as all premiers have done before from Alberta, Alberta premiers, though, she will focus on natural resources. She'll have allies and all of that. But her impact will only be as strong as her tenure as leader of the Conservative Party, the United Conservative Party of Alberta. Okay, uh, Kim? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whether she uh, gets to stampede this year without calls for her resignation is always the uh, the betting game in Alberta politics. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've seen articles already, the the bloodletting and those those are part of the course of all of our viewers will have seen those over the over the years after every campaign. Uh, but when the calls start coming from inside the House, especially such a uh, a uh, hard foundation of that house in uh, UCP politics, it's going to be a challenge for her to manage both the Premier's office and the party. The call is coming from inside the house. Uh, <laughs> Susan, what do you think about the expectations here? I think it will be impossible for Danielle Smith to change her spots when it comes to her views with Ottawa and her relate. She may, I don't think she's going to be able to help herself, quite frankly. She hasn't been able to help herself the whole way along. And quite frankly, if she doesn't do a good job and she dials up the rhetoric big time against Al Alberta, ironically, what she'll do is she'll help the federal liberals. Because if she can't help herself and she can't manage some of the wackier ideas that she tends to put forward, 
the rest of the country will look at her and look at her close alliance with Pierre Polyev and then take another hard look at the Liberals when it comes time to the next election. Okay. Well, again, we continue to watch. Uh, Susan, Tim, Kim, thank you for this. I appreciate the time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. The Premier of Nunavut says he is deeply disheartened, concerned about a new report from Canada's Auditor General that says the territory is failing to protect vulnerable children in its care. Now, these are issues that go to the very basics of child protection, including a lack of response to children who are in crisis and failing to monitor the well-being of children who are sent to foster care. With more, we're now joined by Canada's Auditor General, Karen Hogan. Karen, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure being here. Listen, this is not the first time that your office has raised this issue. It's been raised before, the first time going back to 2011. Was anything done between then and now to, to address any of these issues? So you, you are correct, this is our third audit. We did one in 2011 and one in 2014. And we did see uh, some improvement uh, in between 2011 and 2014, but the situation today is much worse than, than it was all the way back in 2011. Uh, in, in my view, a lot of the, the root causes are really so intertwined um, that it's time for a real different approach in, in order to find a, a sustainable solution uh, for, for child and family services. Okay, and when, when we did, just to let people in, we're talking about a meager or no response to, to suspected cases of harm, no evidence of security checks on adults who would be in contact with children in foster homes, no follow-ups on children put into care. Uh, you, you, you talk about root causes. What exactly are the root causes as you see them? Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. I think you, you outlined the, the findings in the report really well. We found um, failures in almost every area that, that we looked at. And, and I think we asked ourselves the obvious question that everyone would is why? Why did this happen? Uh, while there are probably many root causes, we identified a few that are really interrelated. One would be funding. Uh, when you don't uh, know how many kids are in your care, it's really hard to know whether you have sufficient resources in order to follow up with them or to provide supports to, to the, their families. Um, the second would be staffing. There is chronic staffing shortages uh, in the territory. At some time, some of the areas have almost 50% of their staff that uh, are uh, positions that are vacant. Uh, so there's a lot of reliance on short four-month four contracts. And, and then because of that, you really need training. But we saw an absence of training. Uh, sometimes uh, individuals uh, would not get training at all because training would only be offered every 10 to 19 months. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I would point to is really uh, the lack of a, a cohesive and, and comprehensive information management system. While that might sound really administrative, it is so important um, because the department was unable to actually tell us how many kids were in their care because they don't have complete files, missing information, or sense of, of how many children they need to worry about. How, how is that possible? Is it the information exists in one part of the system but not making it into a centralized part of the system or is it that, that the paperwork is just not being filled out? So, I mean, if that was the case, we would have found it because we visited communities. And what we found is that some communities um, tracked it in different ways. At times it was just paper files, at times things were on USB keys or on someone's computer uh, who might have then left and then that, that computer's wiped clean. So there really isn't a full database. But when there is a file or a case opened uh, for a family or for children, we just saw no documentation in so many areas. So no evidence that required monthly check-ins were happening. No evidence that referrals were being acted on or when they were acted on, what the conclusions were. So there, there was just, it, it's so many things that fed into um, uh, you know, poor information and case management. Which of course, all of this is centered around trying to create what is best for a child in care. So what is the impact to your understanding uh, of these shortfalls to, to children who are in care? I think I would summarize it as there's a, an entire department, the Department of Family Services, whose purpose is to ensure the well-being and care and protection of the children under its care, to support families and communities, and they are failing at that. When they don't know how many children are there, um, or they don't have enough services offered in communities to support families, I mean, we, we saw things that if I, if I could talk about referrals, we mm -hmm. saw when referrals come from uh, they're a police officer or a teacher or a member of the community that there's suspected harm. 
In 20 of the 92 cases, we saw no action activity whatsoever on that referral. And when an investigation was started, half of them were not completed. So it means that children are waiting months, uh, if not years, for the care and help that they, they need. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, your report does not come with any recommendations, and that may go to, to what you were talking about earlier about a different way of trying to address this issue. So, mm -hmm. Could you talk about what you think needs to be done here? So we talked a lot about what would be the right approach, right? We have two previous reports with many recommendations. Those recommendations still hold true today. They need to be acted on. We saw commitments from the government twice and really nothing has improved and so in my view we needed to do something different. It wouldn't be a good use of time to sit down and come out with a detailed action plan again. It's a good use of time to sit together with the government and the departments to collaborate better with Inuit organizations in the communities to find a solution because there's an immediate solution needed to deal with the crisis that's right there in front of them, but then long-term sustainable solutions that are needed to deal with those intertwined root causes that have existed for so long. Well, we, we look to see what happens uh, after this report, but Karen, thank you again for the time today. Thank you. And that's Karen Hogan, the Auditor General of Canada. The high-tech industry group known as Space Canada has a big ask of Ottawa. They want the federal government to create a national space council that would not only develop strategic space policies, but also create jobs that would keep Canada competitive. With more, we're now joined by the CEO of Space Canada, Brian Gallant. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let's begin with this uh, space council, if you will. It sounds like a lot of money. Why create another layer of bureaucracy here? It's really, I think, interesting because the, the reason for it is that 60 years ago when somebody was doing something in space, it was all government-led. And then decade after decade, things were changing. Now, over the last few years, the space sector, what's happening in space has morphed before our very eyes. It's an emerging industry. It's one in which that the functions that we're using space to better our lives here on Earth and here in Canada uh, is changing as well. So because of that, our argument is that over those 60 years, when the systems were put in place to govern space from a from, from Canada point of view, um, it's archaic. So we need to really find a way to get all the departments that have an impact on the space sector and this Canadian space ecosystem, as well as all the departments that could be benefiting from the Canadian space ecosystem to get around the same table. So we would actually argue we don't want really to create another layer or anything like that and really just get the departments with the resources that they have that are already working in space. If they don't have someone working in space, that says a lot and they should have at least some people. And then bringing them to the same table and making sure that space is a priority because it has and will have a huge impact on our societal challenges, our environmental challenges, and I think it represents a great economic opportunity. Okay, well let's build uh, upon some of that because you, you, I'm thinking about, for example, the government already committing billions of dollars to, to upgrade our early uh, warning system. We're talking about satellites, we're mm -hmm. talking about weather satellites. That commitment's already being made and that already, you know, that type of project, th those fingers go into many different departments. So mm -hmm. again, how needed is this agency if those commitments big mm. multi-billion dollar commitments are already being made. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll even add to, to your point, I, I think that it, it was great to see in the last federal budget major investments to extend the International Space Station contributions of our country, uh, also some uh, investments in the Lunar Gateway and Lunar Rover, so, so fantastic and, and applauded by us. Nevertheless, there are still lots of things that need to be done and it's not all about funds. Of course, there's investments that would be very helpful to the industry and to the ecosystem, but it's also about regulation and modernizing our framework. So let's use a quick example. We actually don't have a framework currently in Canada for commercial space launch. It is, we think, imperative that we have the ability to launch from uh, Canada because not only is there an economic opportunity for it, but there's also the fact that with geopolitical tensions on the rise, a need for Canada and its allies to increase its capacity so we're not reliant on countries that might be a little more challenging to work with in the future. So with that, there has to be a whole modernization of the regulations and really develop a framework from scratch so that we can launch commercially uh, here into space from Canada. So with that example, it demonstrates that we're going to need Transport Canada, we're going to need the Canadian Space Agency, we're going to need all these defense, we're going to need all these different departments working on that very specific opportunity. And there are many other types of opportunities like that that are on the 
horizon, pun intended. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we think getting this National Space Council together will help us be nimble, agile, and do it right. Okay, uh, you, you mentioned economic benefit. Is there a dollar number there or a number of jobs? Because I think about all the billions of dollars this country has invested in other high-tech sectors, air and space, and still when we talk about technology in the future, we're talking about the United States, South Korea, uh, Japan, not really Canada. So, mm -hmm. so what dollar figure are you looking at here? Well, in space, what's interesting is we have such a rich history in Canada, and we should be very proud of our contributions. We have a wonderful partnership with NASA in, in the United States, and we've done some amazing things for decades, and we're about to do another amazing thing, which we've already talked about, Michael, with the Artemis program and having a, a Canadian Space Agency astronaut join that, that four-person crew. So, so we should be extremely proud as Canadians of what we've done. Now, there is right now thousands of jobs every single year in Canada that depend on the space sector. There are billions of dollars that uh, come into our country and that, that are generated because of the space sector every single year. Now, that's with a global space company that depends how you kind of slice it, but essentially it's somewhere between 300 billion to 600 billion per year right now. In the future, there are projections that say that it'll become a trillion dollar industry per year by 2040, some even say a $2 trillion industry. So when we see huge economic impact already as is with an industry that is important to us, if we double down and really invest and make it a priority as this industry is emerging and creating a lot of economic opportunity, Canada can see some of that. Uh, and there's all these other functions of helping us fight climate change, uh, helping us with the digital divide, helping ensure that we're secure in our country, all these other things that would be, I think, very beneficial to Canada. Okay, well, we watch on the sidelines. You'll have to keep us up to date. Brian Galland, thank you for the time. Thanks for having me. There was another development on the foreign interference file this week. Conservative MP Aaron O'Toole rising in the House of Commons on a point of privilege Tuesday to say that he too was targeted by China. An apparent intimidation campaign that O'Toole says promoted false narratives about his policies while he was leader of the official opposition. Making matters worse, O'Toole says no one warned him about it. Not only were the multiple threats against me and members of my parliamentary caucus not raised to me by the government or security agencies during the 43rd parliament, but these serious threats were also not communicated to us through the Security and Intelligent Threats to Elections Task Force created by the government in the 43rd Parliament to safeguard our election. The context of the final months of proceedings in this chamber in the 43rd Parliament is also important to consider with respect to my privilege, Madam Speaker. The House at the time was seized with four separate document production orders forcing the government to be accountable to this House about what actually happened at the Winnipeg Laboratory and the firing of scientists with links to China. I know that you remember at the time, Madam Speaker, because the government forced you into federal court over the issue and forced me as a member of this chamber and leader of the opposition to seek intervener status in that proceeding, which ultimately dissolution rendered moot. While denying our privileges as members for disclosure of these documents at the time, the government also denied me and other members of this chamber, including a member in the NDP, knowledge of identified foreign interference threats against us as parliamentarians. This is a matter that should, in, that should concern all members of this House, regardless of party. The threats identified against me by CSIS did not relate to one single event or one single accredited diplomat. Rather, the numerous threats identified to me provide proof of an ongoing campaign of foreign interference intended to disrupt my work as a member, but also to critically disrupt my work as leader of a large parliamentary caucus in a minority parliament. Threats, disruption and interference of this scale actually violated the privilege of hundreds of members of this House. Not only did these events occur before and during the 2021 general election, which has been the subject of considerable reporting in the last year, but they also occurred prior to this election and were in the knowledge or control of the government who refused to act. In fact, CSIS advised me that I will remain a target of Beijing's influence operations 
long after I leave this house this summer. And that was Conservative MP Aaron O'Toole speaking in the House earlier this week. Well, let's take a look at the days ahead now and bring back our journalist panel. Susan Delacorte is columnist with the Toronto Star, Stephanie Taylor, parliamentary reporter with the Canadian Press, and Catherine Levesque, parliamentary reporter for the National Post. Welcome back to the three of you. So, listen, we, we already talked about, of, of course, a big event that's going to happen on Tuesday with David Johnston uh, appearing before a committee. But here we are, about two or three weeks left in this spring sitting. Uh, the government says it still has a lot to do, wants to do more. Uh, what is left on the agenda? Susan? You know, I'm, 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 there's some important things they have to get done, like gun legislation and, um, and various things. But I really feel like a sense of reset is in the air. It's been a while since they shuffled their cabinet. Um, they tend to use summers or breaks for that as well. And there's a real sense, you know, with the turnover in the clerk of the Privy Council this week, a new communications director, that there is some kind of shifting or changing of the guard around uh, the Prime Minister, a reset of some kind. So I think what I'm looking for is a sign that they're moving maybe to another throne speech, maybe a prorogation, um, and, and just a, a total reset. But basically an election footing is what you're looking for well, here. I think they still think they're okay, especially since Jagmeet Singh said last week that he wouldn't trigger an election over this, but I think I think they, they're, they're doing an adjustment like they did when Trump was elected or when Doug Ford was elected, that they really feel they need a, you know, to sharpen it up a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're nodding your head yes there, Stephanie. I, I think if the Liberals can finish this session of Parliament and there's a day or two days where they don't talk about foreign interference, it would be seen as a success for them because this entire session has been dominated. Them on the back foot, them responding to allegations about foreign interference, them responding to allegations about David Johnston, who he's connected to or who he's not connected to. So this week we heard from Liberal House Leader Mark Holland that there's nine priority bills they want to see passed, at least eight passed the House, one to committee. Um, one of them is the budget bill. That mm -hmm. is still going through debate. We've got notice that there's going to be extended sittings on Monday. So the Liberals have signaled that they want to finish the session. They are being quiet on rumors of prorogation, but um, it's still very much a bumpy ride for them getting out of this parliament. And I think that there's a, a number of them in the benches that want to be back in their communities. And as Susan talks about, talking about something else or a sense that they've turned the page or they've gotten some footing on foreign interference that they can talk about other things, whether that be their budget or any of the other priorities they, they want to be talking about, which they haven't been able to do really at all this yeah. winter. Well, as you say, remarkable that this has been the one dominant issue, despite a budget, despite foreign visits, this is the, the dominant issue. Uh, what do you think is left in the, what could be two or three uh, weeks in this spring session? Oh, I think a lot of things are going to, to be happening. Well, first of all, you know, be, because there's so much to do when, you know, the Conservatives have said they, they want to debate things. Well, I mean, Parliament is going to be sitting until midnight um, as of next week, uh, every night. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of, I'll, I'll be looking for the Senate maybe a little bit more because there are, because before we can even think of prorogation, um, there are a number of bills that have been kind of, you know, that the go Liberal government have, has been trying to pass for years now, before the last election, before the prorogation, before that, and namely, uh, you know, that that's C-21, the firearms bill, um, you know, so I'll be looking at that, C-13, the official languages bill, also something that has been promised for years and years, and C-18, uh, which, you know, we're, we're talking a lot because Facebook uh, has, you know, is threatening or has already pulled uh, the, the news from, from their platform. So I, I think th those will be two really big bills that, you know, I think the government is hoping to pass before. And of course the budget bill, um, absolutely, because, you know, this summer they might be able to talk about their Canadian dental plan and the grocery rebate. So they're, they're really hoping uh, it, it's, it's going to be their priority also. Okay, which means to say we have another busy two or three weeks ahead of us. Uh, <laughs> but, but for now, uh, Catherine, Susan, Stephanie, thank you for the time today. And that is our program for this weekend. I'm Michael Serapio. We'll have full analysis of David Johnson's testimony on primetime politics. As we said, that's coming up on Tuesday. But for now, for everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time.